Hello friends, welcome to the world of English literature again. We are discussing the poem for Anne Gregory by William Butler Yeats. Uh, we have already seen part 1 and this is part 2 where we shall discuss questions and figures of speech. My name is Amit and with me is Arzu who is a literature student and a research scholar. So welcome again Arzu. Thank you. Um, in the first part we saw this poem is in three stanzas. In the first one it's a sort of a lovesick stanza where every man is falling in love with this girl with yellow hair who in the second stanza protests what if my hair was not yellow what if it was black or brown or carrot color would those men still love me and in the third stanza the narrator quotes a wise man who's read in a text that only god is capable of loving um, people or women for what they are and not for their external beauty so, um, and we had a discussion around the themes of this, which relates to beauty, which relates to the rights of women and so on and so forth. And um, in this section, we will see um, some more discussion um, on figures of speech and um, the questions that emerge out of this chapter. So, welcome Azu. Um, Thank you, sir. Before we move on to the figures of speech, I would like to ask you that to me, it sounded like what Yeats is trying to say here in the last stanza when he's bringing about this idea that only God is capable of this true love. Only God is capable of loving someone for who they are. And uh, that duality between the outer and the inner that we were talking about at the beginning, Yeats is questioning that duality towards the end. And it reminded me of a lot of our Indian Sufi Bhakti traditions and the Advaita philosophy or the non-dualism that is very prominent in a lot of our literature and our text. So was Yeats also influenced by Eastern philosophy or say Eastern spiritualism? Definitely. That's a very good question. And um, there's a long history um, to this of East influencing the West, which we do not generally um, um, study. We think that most of the knowledge um, came to us in universities and schools through the British, but much before the British were in India, knowledge was flowing from uh, east to west, from Delhi and Tehran um, to Europe. And um, so Schopenhauer read the Upanishads through Dara Shiko's translations in Germany. The famous poet John Keats also was influenced. So were all the romantic poets of Germany and Britain and later Yeats, who is a cusp, who is in between the Romantic tradition and Modernism. I'll briefly explain what Romantic tradition and Modernism are. Um, romantic poetry celebrates nature, equates nature with God. So it does, it's not romance in the regular sense. Um, and Modernism is a movement in the 20th century when writers and artists got tired of um, the mode of realism in which uh, uh, writers were writing about the pastoral beauty of England and other things, whereas wars were raging, there was first world war and later in 1939 there was the second world war. So writers and artists said that we need to look into the inner human experience and they started writing that way. So William Butler Yeats is in between them, between the romantic tradition of John Keats and between the modernist tradition, uh, if you pursue literature further, you will go on to read Joseph Conrad, James Joyce, etc. So coming back to your um, question, Arzu, so there's a long tradition of Sufi and Bhakti texts traveling from east to west and Europeans getting influenced by them. Mm. So what is non-dualism? Non-dualism is there are no two, simply, it is one which is largely the belief in the world that there is uh, one maker, one God, etc. Which essentially means that man and God, woman and God are not separate, um, which to use uh, the terms are Atma and Paramatma, that Atma is a part of Paramatma and vice versa, which both the long Bhakti and Sufi tradition of um, India follow and William Butler Yeats in particular was very influenced um, by these um, ideas of soul that only the soul knows soul. So if we 
discount the discussion that we were doing earlier, if we take it into the realm of this philosophical discussion, it is largely he is saying that human beings until they merge into um, their God, their maker, they are unable to know him completely. Mm -hmm. That the soul merges into the soul, like water droplets merge into the ocean. So there is an example I will give here of what Yeats is trying to say through the example of Sarma, this mad uh, mendicant, this fakir who used to roam around naked on the streets of Delhi, who was a friend of uh, Dara Shiko, um, who was the crown prince, son of Shah Jahan, and was killed by his brother Aurangzeb. So Sarmad was summoned by Aurangzeb after Dara Shiko had died um, and asked questions about God. And Sarmad said, there is no God. He said, La ilaha in Arabic, which means there is no God. He did not complete the whole um, Kalam. And he was beheaded. Uh, so this is very much in the tradition of what um, Yeats is saying much later, that it's only when only God who can love um, unconditionally. And so human beings cannot love unconditionally. So unless they ref um, diffuse, they cease to be human beings, they would not be able to know their maker. Um, and so John Keats also says, beauty is truth, truth is beauty. So they are all in the same tradition of, and they agree that the Atma is a part of Paramatma, but the Atma, the soul, will not have realization of the bigger soul, the larger soul, till it diffuses into the larger soul. So that is what Yeats is probably hinting at over here through the wise man. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation, sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, now let's go to the figures of speech that have been used um, in this poem. <coughs> so one of the um, uh, important things for students to understand at this stage is what a metaphor is. And uh, a metaphor is um, very often used and in fact most of our language is composed of um, uh, metaphors. So can you tell us what a metaphor is? Yeah, so a metaphor posits equivalence between seemingly dissimilar things. It equates those two things not because they are actually the same, but for the sake of comparison or symbolism. For example, if we talk about a soldier in the war, one could say that he was a brave lion in the war. Not to say that he was actually a lion, but just to compare the strength of the lion to the strength of that soldier. Or uh, another example can be in a lot of these Bollywood songs, the beauty of the beloved is compared to the moon, uh, that the face is a moon. The face is not actually a moon, but the glow or the beauty is similar. So the two things are compared because the quality is similar, the symbols are similar. So what metaphors are there in this poem? So the one main metaphor is thrown into despair by those great honey-colored ramparts at your ear. So it's not actually a fort wall at her ear, but her hair is being compared to um, a fort wall, which means that um, she is a castle and Gregory is a castle and the hair is a sort of a rampart. So clearly this is um, an advanced metaphor of using uh, hair as, the, um, as a fortress wall. Mm. All right, let's look at the next figure of speech, which is alliteration, which is repetition of um, consonant sounds. Um, can you give us a few examples? Yeah, it can be anything like, for example, in this poem, the sound m is frequently repeated. So it's important to understand here, students, that we're not talking about the alphabet, but the sound that it produces, not the letter, but the sound. So here, m or m is repeated very frequently. For example, that young men in despair may love me for myself and not my yellow hair. So the repetition of me adds that lyricality to the entire poem. Like we heard that beautiful musical rendition, that music quality also comes through this alliteration and the repetition of consonant sounds. There's also here in this poem, love you for yourself alone and not your yellow hair. And so this Alliteration adds a lot of rhythm um, to po poetry and poetic energy. For those of you writing poetry, 
or aspiring to be poets, it is important to keep in mind these figures of speech which great poets have used. Another interesting um, uh, figure of speech used over here is synecdoche, in which a part is used for the whole. So, for example, here yellow hair is sort of representative for Anne, yeah. even though uh, she does make a difference between herself and her hair, but in general, um, whenever you hear Yeats and yellow hair, you will immediately think of Anne Gregory. Yeah. Yeah. Another um, figure of speech here is anastrophe, sir, would you like to explain that? Um, that is inversion of a sentence structure, a sentence which you would not regularly speak but invert it to fit the rhythm and the meter of the poem. So, for example, here I heard an old religious man, but yesternight declare. So, you would generally say, first of all, you would not use yesternight, but you would use yesterday night in, in prose. So, you would say, I heard an old religious man declare yesterday night. You would also not use but. So, here for the sake of rhythm uh, to keep the meter, uh, the sentence structure is inverted and this is a poetic device used in poetry, it is called anastrophe. Yeah, and those students who have seen Lord of the Rings would be able to relate to this much better. Sure. Because the entire uh, series uses anastrophe very powerfully. Yeah. 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 Then there is apostrophe, which is a direct address to somebody uh, who may not be present at the scene. So, in the third stanza, that only God, my dear, could love you for yourself alone. So, even though we see in the second stanza that the girl protests, um, in the third stanza, the narrator quotes um, a wise man who uses this um, um, phrase um, that God, my dear, could love you for yourself alone. So, the girl is not present over there, but it is an imagined reader, imagined listener who is addressed to. So, like you would see in many um, writings which begin with dear reader or dear diary, people who write diary. Mm -hmm. um, so, it is to an imagined audience. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when we talk of poetry, then we have to talk of rhyme because um, uh, rhyme was an important part of poetry till very late. Now, a lot of people write in free verse, um, prose poetry and so on and so forth. But William Butler Yeats in particular, uh, even though he was uh, from the age of modernism like we discussed, where people were writing in free verse, free verse is where you do not keep rhyme or meter. Um, so, the, but he kept both rhyme and meter as we have discussed a little bit. So, the rhyme scheme here is A, B, C, B, D, B. For example, in the first stanza, never shall a young man thrown into despair by those great honey colored ramparts at your ear love you for yourself alone and not your yellow hair. So, <clears throat> despair rhymes with ear, rhymes with hair. So, all the alternate lines, the second lines rhyme, but the first, third, and the fifth do not rhyme, which is why this kind of a rhyme scheme, which is A, B, C, B, D, B you get the point over here. So, now Arzu, let us discuss the life of William Butler Yeats briefly. Yeats was um, born in 1865, lived until 1939, which is the beginning of the Second World War. And it is very interesting to know that he was buried in Paris where he died. And it took about nine years uh, till the war ended to carry his body back to Ireland because he was the pride of Ireland and the Irish national poet and, and so on and so forth. Uh, would you like to tell us more about um, Yeats? Yeah. So, Yeats was a dramatist and a poet. So, he could write both poetry and write dramas. And it is also interesting to note that considering that this entire poem is in a dialogue format. So, I think his persona as a dramatist also reflects in this poem. And he in fact won a Nobel Prize in 1923 for drama. Uh, being one of the very few people whose best work is after Nobel. His best work being, what, is, what do you think, sir, what is Yeats' best work? His best work is his poetry, and um, um, which is very rooted in Irish folk culture and, and the stories that he heard from the elders over there. And so, his best poetry that we remember, the world remembers, is his poetry towards the end of his life, where 
also he also gets very interested in Eastern spiritualism and combines the Western uh, materialist tradition, uh, the stress in ma materialism with the spiritual tradition of the East. So, it is very interesting. Most people um, are in their prime um, and their later work is, is not very great, but for Yeats, it is the opposite. Uh, his best work is towards the end of his life. We earlier saw that um, uh, he is at a time which is between the bridge between romantics and modernism, uh, between all the nature poetry of Wordsworth and John Keats and um, others and modernism um, which is Pablo Picasso, Virginia Woolf, etc., who you will read um, later if you pursue literature. Um, he also had a lifelong interest in spiritualism, occultism, astrology, as we have been talking about his deep interest in Eastern spirituality. And he was an Irish nationalist, like we uh, discussed that the British Isles um, ruled over um, Ireland. So, Ireland was a colony and there was a long struggle for the freedom of Ireland. But he did not involve himself directly in intense politics. As a writer, he thought it is important to keep a distance, uh, that the role of an activist and a politician and a writer are different. And as already pointed out, I think in the last session, Maud Gon, who was a firebrand political activist, uh, who Yeats was madly in love with, refused his marriage proposals thrice because he could not commit to her kind of um, politics. Also, Yeats, as we have seen through this poem as well, and the other poem that we discussed um, with the dancer in the dance, is a very symbolist poet. He uses imagery, symbolism, like here there is the imagery of fort, fortress, ramparts, wall, um, and uh, the image of God, etc. Sir, but I am also wondering that who was Anne Gregory? Did, was she a real person? Did Yeats know her? Who is this person that we are talking yes, about? Yes, she is a real person and there is a very interesting um, um, sketch of her, an interview of her, um, of which uh, we could uh, share the URL and, and students could um, um, hyperlink to it. So, um, Anne Gregory was a girl who was the granddaughter of Lady Gregory. Lady Gregory started the Abbey Theatre, which um, as Yeats was very closely associated with being a playwright and a dramatist. Um, and many uh, important writers of the time used to come to this place called Cool. So, Cool was the cool place for writers, let us say. And Yeats was um, in his later years and um, he saw this girl and wrote this poem about her and called her and read it out um, to her. So, initially she was not um, impressed um, by the poem, um, but when he put it to a little music, when he hummed it, um, then she was impressed. So, uh, the whole question of um, a woman's agency we have been discussing, the girl who he wrote it for thought that it was like a doggerel. A doggerel is um, um, a basic song which let us say soldiers sing or item numbers or, or things like that, which are meant just to tap your feet and which do not have a, a deeper meaning. So, it took time for Anne Gregory, the, the girl, to get convinced that this was um, a beautiful poem. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for that explanation, sir. I think our students would also be interested to know what other questions could we extract out of the poem and what all, what all questions could be important for this chapter. Sure. So, let us discuss the chapters that are in the textbook um, itself, um, which will help the students. I think we have covered all the points, but um, as framed questions, let us look at all these things again. So, so I will ask you questions and then we will have discussion over yeah, that. Sure. Okay. So, the first one, what does the young man mean by great honey colored ramparts at your ear? Why does he say that young men are thrown into despair by them? So, we have already discussed this very thoroughly. The great honey colored ramparts at your ear is a metaphor for her hair that is falling on her ear. It is a beautiful imagery, a very romantic imagery of Anne Gregory and her beautiful hair. And young men are thrown into despair because of the beauty and because of the affection that the beauty leads to. And also the rampart or the fortress 
or the boundary wall sort of around Anne Gregory is also a symbol for the border around her soul. And because men can't penetrate through it, men are thrown into despair. Right. What else do you think? No, I think that that covers it. Um, though there's, if you want to take a more feminist point of view, um, it is um, like hiding her. Um, it's a protection for for the young girl from from the attackers, from the wooers, all these people falling into despair. So it's a defense mechanism. Mm. It's, it's also a wall. Right. Yeah. Let's look at the next question. What color is the young woman's hair? What does she say, say she can um, um, do to change it? Why would she want to do so? So as it's repeated throughout the poem, the woman's hair is yellow. It's golden. And uh, she says she could change it to brown or black or carrot. And it's because she wants to test the affection of all the suitors. Are they in love with her only because of these golden hair? Or will they also stay in love with her? if she is away from these golden hair, if she gets rid of them. So it's sort of a test to see if their affection is only superficial or can they truly love her for who she is. The use of um, honey colored and yellow is uh, very interesting over here. As to, and you would find it in a lot of literature that uh, yellow is referred to as the color. And which I think um, is because of uh, Yellow is a fertility symbol, which is that fields are full of um, mustard plants or daffodils in Wordsworth's poems. The color of sun is yellow. So yellow is the color of bounty, munificence, um, wealth and fertility in, in these terms. And so it's also interesting to see how colors are used by um, yeah. writers. Okay, let's look at the next question. Objects have qualities which make them desirable to others. Can you think of some objects, a car, a phone, a dress, and say what qualities make one object more desirable than other? Imagine you were trying to sell an object. What qualities would you emphasize? So this is a question for discussion among students um, in a classroom. And it's not that setting over here. But um, if you can throw some light on how we perceive objects and how we like to project them. Yeah, I think the question talks a lot about desirability and what makes an object desirable. So we all come with our own prejudices, biases, notions that we hold and that is how we approach the world around us. Even the objects, say a new phone that is launched in the market is more desirable because of its novelty. It's a new phone and that is the reason it's more desirable. The new features are more desirable. So different things have different reasons for desirability and utility is not the only reason. So the latest model 2020 yeah. must be better than 2019. Exactly. We assume even though functionally maybe the older model is, is much better. Maybe or, people like yeah. smaller phones now all the phones are big. Yeah. Um, and so there is a sort of a peer pressure that is built through the media um, and through perception, collective perception of what is desirable and what is um, not desirable. So this is something one must think about whether we desire something because we inherently desire it or because we are made to desire it. We have also discussed um, gender roles earlier. Um, also there is a very interesting um, uh, essay by Roland Barth about toys hmm. where he says that boys are made to play with guns and cars and men are just overgrown boys and women are uh, girls, young girls are need to play with kitchen sets, that there is nothing inherently about boys and girls that they want to play with these things or grow up to be men liking fast cars or women loving the kitchen, but they are conditioned into it um, right from childhood. Yeah. And so desire may not be an intrinsic thing, but something which is mediated through the society and through the media is something that all of you must think about. So that was the discussion on the poem for Anne Gregory by William Butler Yeats. And we saw it from various dimensions, what beauty is, what love is, whether human beings can love each other the way God um, can love human beings, whether men uh, frame women's beauty in a certain manner and various other questions. So um, it was a very enjoyable session. 
um, and very thought provoking and I hope you learnt um, um, something with us. Thanks a lot Arzu. Thank you. Um, and um, friends, we hope to see you soon with um, another poem, another story in this world of English literature. Thanks a lot.